Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the April 2025 CTSS Monthly Quiz. We have 10 cases for you. I hope you find them interesting, and I hope you find them helpful. And with that, let's get started. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, you can see we have images at the level of the knee and then beneath the knee in the mid-calf, and you can see laterally along the fascia, there's air tracking along the fascial planes. Now you can get air from intramuscular injection, you can get air from trauma, but when you see air, you gotta be thinking about infection. And when it goes along the fascial planes like that, and the soft tissue swelling, yes, you can consider an abscess, but the tracking is more than an abscess. I don't see any osteomyelitis here. I'm not even giving you bone windows. This is not the look of a resolving hematoma. This is the classic appearance of necrotizing fasciitis, which is a medical and surgical emergency. Patients could get extremely septic and, in fact, die. This will need to have surgery with debridement. So in a very important diagnosis. We can see necrotizing fasciitis nearly throughout the entire body. It's more common in some patients, including patients with IV drug abuse. The most likely diagnosis in this case, when you look at the axial and coronal views, we see a mass in the region of the right adrenal gland. It has areas of high density, which make us think about a prior bleed. It's not dense enough for calcification, when you look at the contralateral left adrenal, it's normal. So this doesn't have the look of a classic adenoma. It still could be an adenoma because adenomas can bleed, but adenomas are typically homogeneous in attenuation. Pheochromocytomas are usually hypervascular, but they can be cystic, but you would expect more enhancement. A simple adrenal cyst is water density, and this has high density within it. Now again, Remember, adrenal cysts, pheochromocytomas, and adenomas can all bleed, but I said classic adenoma. The thing we're dealing with most here is a bleed, and so the answer B, adrenal adenoma with bleed, is the correct answer. Again, pheos are statistically the most common lesion to bleed. Adrenal cysts essentially never bleed. ACCs can bleed and adenomas, particularly when they're larger, can bleed. It's often a very difficult diagnosis, and the diagnosis is typically made following surgery. A very nice example. In this patient with back pain, what's the most likely diagnosis? Well, what we see is a mass which infiltrates the right psoas muscle, tracks down the right psoas muscle to the iliopsoas muscle, and down to the level of the left femur. Now, lymphoma can involve muscle, but tracking along the course of this muscle, and that being the only finding which we see, would be really unusual. It's low density, and again, an intramuscular bleed can track along the muscle, but we would expect areas of high density, and we really don't see them here. Aggressive sarcoma, or a sarcoma is a consideration, including a liposarcoma, but there's no fat, but... Again, very well-defined, and sarcomas usually have more irregular borders. But a low-density lesion, you always have to think about a neurogenic tumor. So although few of these answers are possibilities, and I can't definitely exclude them, the most likely answer is going to be a neurogenic tumor or a nerve sheath tumor. And the uh, posterior aspect of the abdomen is the best location for neurogenic tumors, Remember, in the chest, also neurogenic tumors are best seen posteriorly by the spine, but not always. In this patient with a history of IV drug abuse, the best diagnosis is, well, you see a mass, the inner aspect of the upper thigh. It's large, it's cystic, and it's enhancing. You could see on the coronals how it tracks down the uh, length of the muscle. Now, in theory, you could say this is a sarcoma. If you had a history of a patient with a mass in the thigh and pain, a sarcoma is not a bad thought. Again, I mentioned IV drug abuse. Now, sometimes the history can be confusing, 
but with a lesion that's low density with rim enhancement, tracks along the course of a muscle, and an IV drug abuse history, you got to think about an abscess. Hematoma could be an old hematoma, but the mass effect and distribution is not great. And metastasis to muscle do occur, but usually it's more focal. So all things considered with the history and everything, my first thought is an abscess. You would need to stick a needle in this, then culture it. Again, there is a small chance this could have been a tumor. In this patient with hematuria, what's the best diagnosis? Well, when you look at the kidneys as we see them, they look okay. But when you look at the bladder, there's diffuse wall thickening on the right side of the bladder. It's asymmetric thickening, and there's calcification present. When you have a bladder lesion with calcification, you got to think about malignancy. Now, to be fair, TB can cause a bladder lesion, and it can calcify, but usually it's more extensive and thinner calcification. This is not a blood clot because the high density kind of excludes that. You can have BCG treatment of a bladder lesion, and those lesions following treatment can calcify. So there are several good possibilities here, but with a history of hematuria, the best diagnosis, till proven otherwise, is a bladder cancer, asymmetric wall thickening with calcification. The most likely diagnosis in this case well, the first thing is you see the spleen is diffusely calcified. To me, that's always going to be sickle cell disease to be proven otherwise. Spotty calcifications can be seen in tuberculosis or histoplasmosis. You can see cystic lesions with calcification in patients with uh, multiple hemangiomas in the spleen, but the spleen is also small. The other thing is look at the bony changes, those kind of step-offs, a very classic for sickle cell disease. In patients with thalassemia, the spleen is enlarged and the bony changes are different. Renal osteodystrophy, you can have calcifications almost anywhere, but the spine does not look like renal osteodystrophy and it would be unusual to have this appearance in the spleen for renal osteodystrophy. And of course, metastatic prostate cancer, spleen's typically not involved at all and the lesions in bone do not look like metastatic disease. So a very nice example of sickle cell disease with autoinfarcted spleen and bony changes of sickle cell disease. In this patient with fever, the best diagnosis is, when you look at the liver and spleen, they look okay. The pancreas we see looks okay. But in the left kidney, there are multiple wedge-shaped defects. The differential diagnosis is between infection and infarction. The thing that's helpful, now unilateral or bilateral, truthfully, infarcts or infection could be unilateral or bilateral. This is not radiation therapy changes because it does not match a port. Sepsis would be more likely with infection, but it can be with infarction. Acute pylo versus infarcts. What pushes me to the diagnosis of infarcts in this case the lesions are sharply marginated and they're wedge-shaped. With pylo, you can see focal or diffuse involvement, but the margins typically aren't so sharp. So the best diagnosis here and the right diagnosis was multiple renal infarctions. The most likely diagnosis in this case, well, there's a mass about three centimeters lower pole lateral aspect of the left kidney. Contralateral right kidney looks okay. I don't see adenopathy or any other finding. Now, this is a vascular renal lesion. The most likely diagnosis statistically is going to be renal cell carcinoma. 85% of renal cells and typically the vascular ones are going to be clear cell, which is the answer. This does not have the appearance of an AVM. You don't see feeding or draining vessels. Melanoma typically is not very vascular. And lung cancer goes to kidney, can be solitary or can be multiple, but they're usually hypovascular. So the best answer here is a clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which is typically hypervascular and may be very well defined as it is in this case. The most likely diagnosis in this case, 
Two findings. The first one is an obvious large mass in the left adrenal gland. If that was my only finding, I would say primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. But you also need to consider other possibilities, including Theo, perhaps. It doesn't look like a hematoma, but an old hematoma can look like a big adrenal mass. So those are all possibilities. But then when you look at the liver carefully, particularly on the coronal views, you can see there's an infiltrating process in the liver. The liver also looks cirrhotic. And yes, adrenal cortical carcinoma can metastasize to the liver. But when I see a cirrhotic liver and a liver mass, and then I see an adrenal mass, my best diagnosis is hepatoma with adrenal metastasis, which indeed was the correct answer in this patient. The least likely diagnosis in this case is, you see a cystic lesion tail of pancreas with calcification. This could be a neuroendocrine tumor. They can calcify, they can be cystic. Possibility, a spend tumor is commonly cystic and solid. Serous cystadenoma, I don't know, that's maybe not the best example I've ever seen, but serous cystadenomas can be cystic, can have calcifications and enhancement. Metastasis to the pancreas, if it was renal cell, the lesions would be very vascular, but this is kind of cystic with calcification. Most metastasis to the patient's pancreas whether it's lung or breast or even kidney, the lesions are typically going to be hypovascular. They're not going to contain calcification. So I would say the least likely diagnosis in this patient is metastasis to the pancreas. Now you asked me the question, what was this lesion? I would have bet it was a neuroendocrine tumor. It ended up, this was an older patient, and ended up being a spend tumor. Spend tumorous patients are usually teens or 20s. But every once in a while, you see them in patients in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Just a very nice example. So with that, we've done 10 excellent cases. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I hope you enjoyed the quiz nature of the program. And I hope to see you again next month. Have a great day, everybody. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.